This is Revelation chapter 7, and the theme is the church age versus the time of Jacob's trouble. And we're going to see some things that are a lot different in this chapter between the church age and the tribulation. And even a non-dispensationalist will be able to see some clear differences. So let's start out in verse 1. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. The Bible says the earth is a circle in Isaiah 40 and verse 22. The four corners of the earth will stand for north, south, east, and west. And the four winds would stand for the winds from each of these directions. And the Bible will talk about each of these winds. In Proverbs 25, 23, it talks about a north wind. In Psalm 78, 26, it talks about an east and south wind. In Exodus 10, 19, it talks about a west wind. And notice that the angels are strong enough to hold the wind. And if God allowed it, they would be able to control the weather. You see this counterfeited in movies, recent movies like Geostorm. And uh, you hear about men using the harp machine to control the weather. But maybe these same men who are trying to control the weather will be tricked into thinking they are controlling the catastrophic weather that goes on in the time of Jacob's trouble when it is actually God just letting them think they have control. And then Revelation 7, 2 says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So they have the seal of the living God. Jesus Christ is alive and well. He didn't stay dead. He is the living God. He is he that liveth and was dead. And behold, he is alive forevermore. As he also says in the book of Revelation. He isn't like Buddha or any of the other false gods who died and stayed dead. And uh, Revelation 7.3 Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I believe this shows that God has a specific purpose for each angel. Angels are used for different things in the scripture. Uh, The angel here is giving a message to the other angels. This angel cries to the other angels with a loud voice. Uh, Picturing this scene in our head is an awesome thought. What if the people on earth can hear the angel crying with a loud voice? Imagine how scared people are going to be in the Great Tribulation when they see all these scary things happening and all these creatures they've never seen before, like an angel in the sky screaming with a loud voice. This ought to make you want to get saved today so you don't have to go through that horrible time period. This angel has an urgent message for the other four angels, and he tells them not to hurt the earth until the 144,000 have a seal in their foreheads. And then in Ezekiel chapter 9, God sets a seal on those who sigh and cry for all the abominations that are being done. So these 144,000 Jewish saints are probably disgusted with the wicked abominations going on in the earth as well. And looking back at those verses in Ezekiel, chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, it says, And the Lord said unto him, And go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. And this too ought to represent how we feel about the abominations going on in the world. As Christians, we should not be of the world. The world is our enemy, and God is our friend. The world is against God. 
so we should be against the world. And now, knowing that these saints have a seal in their forehead, this shows the first difference between the church age and the time of Jacob's trouble that I want to bring up. It shows the difference between a saint in the body of Christ and a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. These 144,000 aren't sealed the way me and you are sealed. If you look at Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And then Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I'm already sealed. And every born-again Christian alive is already sealed. And this sealing took place right at right when you believe the gospel. These 144,000 are already saints, but the seal they get didn't come along with their salvation, but at a later time. And that's a difference between a church age saint and these 144,000. It can't be the same. Revelation 7 4 says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And this verse shows that the book of Revelation is dealing with Israel. Uh, a lot of people hate that because they can't stand Israel. They think that the church replaced Israel. And it also shows that the church is not Israel. It's not the 144,000. These are 144,000 virgin male saints. And this isn't spiritual Jews. So it isn't... Uh, Something other than literal children of Israel. It is literal Jews, obviously, from reading the verses. So it refers to a body of saints who are only Jews. They are children of Israel. And this is different from the church age. In the church age, there is one body made up of Jews and Gentiles. And once you are placed in this body, the body of Christ... You are spiritually no longer Jew or Gentile. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now in Revelation 7, it lists the tribes and how many saints in each tribe. Revelation 7, 5 through 8 says, Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. So where are the tribes today? God knows where the tribes are. And the same God who can raise up cremated bodies at the rapture can easily locate the tribes. Notice that there are two tribes missing from the list. And that would be Ephraim and Dan. And I believe that they are excluded because this has something to do with their idol worship. If you look at 1 Kings twelve twenty eight and 29, it says, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. So they put calves of gold in Bethel, which is located in Mount Ephraim, according to Judges 4-5, and they put the other, other idol in Dan. And Hosea 4-17 says, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. So it seems they are replaced for the reason of idol worship. The 144,000 are also mentioned in Revelation 14, 1-5. And it says, And I looked, and behold, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, 
having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So anyone who claims to be the 144,000 that isn't a virgin or is married or is a woman can't be in the 144,000. These are 144 Jewish virgin males that have a mark. So if you don't meet these credentials, then don't call yourself one of the 144,000. This knocks out any Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. I don't believe the 144,000 are reappearances of Old Testament saints because nothing implies that it is. It seems like men claim that for the sake of wanting to believe, wanting to believe God is now done with Israel. They are so concerned with teaching the church has replaced Israel that they want to make these 144,000 to be resurrected Old Testament saints because they don't believe there is any real Jew around anymore. But now, moving on, we're going to see another body of believers. Once again, different from the church age, which only has one body of believers. There is one body. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles, and we're saved by grace through faith without works. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So there is going to be an innumerable multitude of people who are saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. Anyone in their right mind would get saved during this time, when so many supernatural events are taking place. Notice it says they have palms in their hands. And if you've read the Gospels, this reminds you of something in the Gospels. This is because Jesus Christ is going to make another triumphal entry at the second advent. Notice how they did this when he was here the first time. In John twelve thirteen, it says, Took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So Jesus Christ is going to be making his second triumphal entry at the second coming. In Revelation 7, 10 and 11, it says, And cried with a loud voice, saying to our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. I'd like to point out this verse shows a difference between angels and the four beasts. I believe the four beasts are seraphim. It says in Revelation 4 that they have six wings matching their description in Isaiah 6. And many will say that seraphim and cherubim are angels. But notice in Revelation 7, 11, it has them as two different groups of creatures. I also like to point out that the angels fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. They didn't fall backwards like at a Benny Hinn meeting. But look at what they say as they worship. Revelation 7.12 says, Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So they say, Amen, because... Jesus Christ is the Amen according to Revelation 3.14. Notice also they bless him. Psalms 103.20 says, Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. It says they also give him glory. First Peter 5.11 says to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. They say wisdom. 
And 1 Corinthians one twenty five says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, they say thanksgiving. And Psalm 69.30 says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Psalms 95.2 says, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. They say honor. And Psalm 66.2 says, Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. They proclaim his power. And 1 Corinthians 2.5 says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. And lastly, they say might. While Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. So all these things that they say about him can be backed up with scripture. And then Revelation 7.13 and 14 it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Notice these guys came out of great tribulation, not out of the great tribulation. Great tribulation is a description, and not an actual title of that time. So all these people saying, we're going through the tribulation. It's really not called that even though we say it. You know, every every now and then we say the tribulation when describing that time period. But the title is the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's a time of tribulation. And notice the verse says they washed their robes and made them white. This is different from church age saints because God is the one who washes us. Revelation 1 5 says unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The Bible is very clear and descriptive with words. Jesus Christ washed us. In Revelation 7 14, these saints washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Their robes are white because Isaiah 1 18 says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The Pharisees in Luke 20 and 46 love to walk in long robes, similar to how very religious people do today. And this makes them feel spiritual and important and righteous. And clothes don't make a man righteous or truly show their righteousness now. But one day, our clothes will show our righteousness when we get our white robes. If these who came out of great tribulation are the church, then most likely John would know who they are because he is part of the church and he is even a type of the church. So why would he not know who these saints are? Revelation 7.15 says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. For his pleasure we are and were created. And they serve him day and night. People who hate bedtime will love heaven because there is no bedtime. Notice that heaven would be every child's fantasy because bedtime never comes and you stay young forever. And people try to have this today in this life, but they can't. Revelation 7.16 says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. These saints were hungry and thirsty because they couldn't buy or sell. They didn't take the mark of the beast, so they couldn't get food and water from the store. I believe it points out the sun lighting on them and the heat because... During the time of Jacob's trouble, the sun scorches men. You can read about that in Revelation. And they won't have this problem anymore. And then Revelation 7.17 7, says, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The same God who took care of them on earth will take care of them in heaven. He wipes away all tears from their eyes. This is the opposite of someone who goes to hell. People in hell will be crying in torments. I believe we will shed tears at the judgment seat of Christ. And those who 
weep now will weep less at the judgment seat of Christ. And even though these saints came out of great tribulation, they make it out okay in the end. They could have escaped the time of Jacob's trouble completely if they were saved before the rapture. And if you want to be saved and miss the time of Jacob's trouble, miss all the disasters of the book of Revelation, and completely just bypass all of that, take another road, then you need to believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is Jesus died. He died for you. He died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. You need a Savior because you're a sinner. Without that Savior, you're going to go to hell to pay for your sins. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is only one way out of the judgment on sin, which is hell. There's only one way out of hell, and that's to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for your sins. And if you want to be saved, you need to put your trust in him and what he did on your on the cross as the payment for your sin. Put your trust in that to save you and to get you to heaven. And if you'll do this, then you can be saved and have eternal life. Acts 16:31 says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. It says in the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on him.